All right. Um, <clears throat> so those of you who are um, taking uh, uh, both my classes this semester, um, you've been accustomed to I mean, lately just packing a ton of material into this class period and then not having nearly as much to say in uh, PDE. But I think today might be opposite day um, in that respect, just because for this class, I just don't have as many pages. Uh, thank God. Uh, so um, we'll see if that means that uh, there'll be some time at the end for any um, uh, homework questions. I know some of you have turned it in already um, or certainly turned in a, um, a quiz. And I've I've not yet looked at any of that. That's what ruining this weekend is for. So, um, <clears throat> but today we're uh, um, starting a new chapter, literally, um, on uh, uh, least squares problems. Okay, so do the old screen share. Okay. All right. Um, now, let's see. Now, so far, everything we did in chapter three was about um, solving AX equals B, where A was square and invertible, n by n, uh, no longer. Uh, now we're going to assume that a could possibly be a, uh, a, a, a tall, thin matrix. Uh, so m by n, where uh, m is the number of rows, that's greater than or equal to the number of columns. Uh, and in particular, uh, certainly when uh, m is great, strictly greater than n will be of uh, interest. So, so we're still looking at ax equals b. Um, but no longer square. And uh, the assumption we're going to make is A has full column rank. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, so the, um, the rank of A is the number of uh, linearly independent rows or columns. So Row rank is linearly independent rows. Uh, column rank is how many linearly independent columns. Um, it's known that for any matrix, the row rank and the column rank are always the same. So we just call that the rank. Um, so, so to elaborate uh, means the columns of A are linearly independent. And uh, A is not invertible if greater, M is greater than N, because um, invertibility only makes sense for square matrices. A rectangular matrix uh, cannot have an inverse. Um, you can say that A is still non singular. Now, so one thing I have to clarify is that um, uh, in chapter three, I used um, invertible and non-singular interchangeably. And when you're talking about square matrices, uh, that's okay. Um, but in this setting, it's we had to be a little more careful. Um, and uh, matrix A is uh, singular. Uh, so, and I don't know if I really gave a formal definition before, uh, just because before we could just say if it's singular, it's not invertible. But um, I should give it the proper definition, if and only if um, there exists a non-zero uh, vector x such that ax equals zero. All right, so if AX equals zero, um, 
has a non-trivial solution, then we say it's singular. Um, so if A is square, then that's the same thing as saying that the determinant is zero. A is not invertible, but if, uh, but now we're, we're in non-square territory. OK, um, so the matrices that we'll be dealing with in this chapter are non-singular, that A equals zero only has the uh, trivial solution. Um, okay. Now, um, when does the x equal b have a solution? Well, in general, um, it has a uh, solution only if b happens to be in the range uh, of a. Um, meaning that a, a, a synonym of range is it's in the column space of A. Okay. Um, and to flush this out a little more, um, When we look at the equation ax equal b, uh, that b is a linear combination of the columns of a and the coefficients of a linear combination are in x. So that's all ax equals b is saying. Okay. Um, so, so if this is the case, if b is in the range of a, and because a has full column rank, if there is a solution at all, um, then it's unique. Okay. All right. So I'm going to emphasize that point. It's only true because a has full column rank. Whereas if this was not true, then if uh, AX equals B has a solution at all, it would actually have infinitely many solutions. All right, so we're not dealing with that case. We're just dealing with AX equals B. If it exists, it's unique. Okay, okay. but what if it doesn't exist? Um, that's gonna be the case that's uh, uh, more interesting. Now to give an example, Okay, um, so here's a matrix A and a vector B. Um, so this system of equations, AX equals B, does have a solution. Um, can anyone tell me what the solution would be? One, one, zero. Oh, so close. Now, keep in mind, the number of elements of X. One, one. Yeah, has to be two, the number of columns of A. So, yes, it's one, one. Um, normally, read as a column vector, but that's why I have a transpose here. Okay. All right, but if I change B to be... Uh, one, 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 there's no solution because any linear combination of these columns of A is going to have zero as a third element. So if, if B has a non-zero third element, there's no solution. <clears throat> so what about that case? Um, um, if B is not in the range of A, so AX equals B has no solution whatsoever, um, then 
we're going to try to do the next best thing. Since uh, we're going to try to make B, find X so that B minus AX is as small as possible uh, in some sense. So like we could try to minimize the norm of B minus AX uh, by finding the right X that will minimize this. Um, now, we have to figure out well, what norm do we want to use? Um, and then once we've decided on that, how would we find the X that would make this as uh, small as possible? So this could be one of the P norms that I covered uh, last time. Okay. Um, okay, and I got to mention something at, uh, actually it's in a subsection I didn't cover, so I'll just give a definition here. Um, all right, so for future reference, uh, this is a very important term to know when dealing with system of equations, this vector b minus ax that we want to be zero, but in this scenario could very easily be non-zero, we call this a residual vector. So it's a measure of how close x comes to satisfying ax equals b. And there's, and there's no point in talking about it before because in chapter three, square invertible matrices, uh, we had methods that would always make the residual zero. <clears throat> okay. Um, so what about choosing a norm? That's, that's going to affect how uh, we will proceed because um, if I try to minimize B minus AX in like in the one norm sense or two norm or infinity norm, that's going to give me a different X. Um, now, a good reason not to choose the one norm or infinity norm, these are easier norms to work with, like uh, certainly uh, matrix norms are. Um, but um, the one norm is the sum of all the absolute values of uh, the n elements of x. Um, the infinity norm is the size of the um, largest element of x. So, so this function we're trying to minimize, which is the p norm of b minus ax, not a differentiable function in these cases. Um, so, because when we're trying to find a minimum of a function, um, actually, it should make that a vector x. Yay, never typo in a book. Um, okay. So I have to note these things or I will forget. Um, okay. Um, it's like I find a new one every day. Um, <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, because we're trying to find a minimum of some function, a natural uh, path towards that is to use ideas from calculus. Like you, whatever function you're trying to find a minimum or maximum of, you take a derivative, set it equals zero, and so forth. We can't do any of that if. Um, we're using a one norm infinity norm because of a lack of differentiability. So for that reason, we're going to use the um, two norm. Um, okay, so um, so so in this case, we can actually find a solution, and that's what I'm going to show you uh, today. Okay. I have um, a question, yeah. Yeah. Like I've seen this, we always say that if p is one or infinity, the function is not differentiable. Mm -hmm. But I think maybe for the p equals one, I can understand. Because when p is equals one, we have absolute value function. Mm -hmm. An absolute value is not differentiable because of the sharp edges, right? Yeah. So, but when p is infinity, I don't know how the function looks like. So I don't really understand why we say it's not differentiable. Yeah. Um. Okay, I guess what I'm really saying there is it's unclear how one would go about taking the derivative of it. Um, 
for purpose of finding an algorithm for minimizing uh, an infinity norm. Um, well, let's see. Um, because um, so the idea is if, if you have a vector X uh, changing in a continuous manner, um, then um, well, oh, you know what? Um, okay, let's see. I, let, let, let's let's consider a case similar to the case that causes problems for one norm. Uh, let's suppose that x is zero. Um, so then, let's see. So what? So then, if you're changing x in any direction, then when you change in that direction, whatever component in that direction happens to be the largest, that's going, that component's going to be the infinity norm. Um, so then, um, but let's suppose you, you're changing x away from zero in a direction where you have um, multiple components being equal, like like say you're changing in, in, in the one one direction. Um, OK. Um, sorry, that's something I'm prepared to reason all the way through. <laughs> um, but it makes me wonder if there's a situation where it's not clear if there would be a unique rate of change. Um, and, and probably the easiest way to try to sort it out would be in the case where, uh, like, like say if you have, um, like you're in two dimensional space, um, hmm. Okay. And I, I'm, I'm trying to recall if I read somewhere about the, um, infinity norm not being differentiable. Yeah, because I'm thinking like I don't know because I I have really thought about this like for the p norm if we plot the graph of absolute value function we can see that the function is not differentiable so but using infinity norm I don't know if we can plot this function because we say maximum of the absolute yeah. value so do we say it's the same thing as the absolute value function? Is that why? Uh, um, okay, uh, uh, doing some cheating here and looking it up. <laughs> um, the infinity norm is differentiable, except uh, where you have a case where um, if you have a if a vector x has at least two components with uh, the same magnitude that is largest. Okay. Um, yeah. So. So what can happen is that in that case you may have a ill-defined rate of change depending on which direction you change in. Um, so my, my 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 hunch was right that uh, at least that, that there was a there would be an, a uniqueness issue um, because the, the thing is you have to have a at a certain point you have to have a well-defined rate of change. Um, uh, no matter how cha how it changes, like if you can't can have like a different left side or right side derivative, but apparently that's not the case in these limited cases. Okay. Yeah. Just stick to the two norm then. Yep. Okay. Um. So a two norm of a vector is a square root of sum of squares. So it's a sum of squares we're trying to make as small as possible. And that's why solving this problem in this manner using a two norm is called solving a least squares problem. So that's that's where the term least squares come from. Um, so what I'm going to do is show some methods for solving this problem if A has full column rank. So if A does not have full column rank, if there's linearly dependent columns, that's a whole other can of worms that's in a later section of the chapter. And unfortunately, I won't be covering that uh, in this class. It's kind of a pain. Um, but um, so let me make clear there's a, there's a distinction between full rank and rank deficient least squares problems. The approaches are quite different. 
Okay, so how are we going to solve it in the full rank case? Uh, so one approach is the uh, normal equations. Um, so I get to find a function um, of a components of x, and it'll be one half b minus ax two norm squared. The factor for of one half is not absolutely necessary, but it's there for convenience. Actually, I'm going to move this onto a new page. Okay. Um, so we can try to find the uh, minimum of this using ideas from uh, uh, multivariable calculus. Um, so, because um, to find a uh, minimum of a function of several variables, what you do is you take the gradient of the function and you set it equal to zero. Um, and then the... Um, Hessian, which is a matrix of second partial derivatives of this function, needs to be positive definite. Recall I talked about positive definite matrices a couple sections ago uh, for the uh, uh, Cholesky factorization. Um, now, this is going to be a rather complicated function of x, so I'm going to focus on simpler functions of x to use as uh, uh, building blocks. Okay. Um, okay, so this is what I was talking about a second ago. Um, so, a refresher for multivariable calculus. Oh, wait, something missing here? Hold on. Um, oh, yep, I do have something missing here. Hold on. It was taken from my book, but I cut out certain things and um okay hold on so one thing that's going to help us and um this is actually one of the problems from a section by checking if did i assign it uh no i did not okay i have to check that because that way it's okay for me to give the answer uh, <laughs> um Okay, so, um, so what we have is, um, if I define psi of x to be equal to the dot product of x with a vector c, Then the gradient of psi of x is um, just going to be the vector c. Now, to convince yourself of that, imagine if x was just a number instead of a vector. Then it's just the linear function c times x, and a derivative of that would be c. So if this is a generalization of that to um, multivariable. And then another function of interest is a, a quadratic form, x transpose b x for some matrix b. Uh, that has to be square. So if I take a gradient of that, uh, that turns out to be b plus b transpose uh, x. Okay. Um, so, so, so these will be helpful to us in taking the gradient uh, of this. Um, okay. And how do you get these? I won't do all the details now, but, um, but what you're doing, you're taking partial derivatives. respect to each xi, and you're using this um, differentiation rule, the partial derivative of xi, 
with respect to XJ is equal to delta IJ. Can anyone tell me what this is called? It's come up in, in other classes and so forth, but delta IJ, delta with two subscripts, uh, their indices. Kronecker delta. delta. And um, the formula for it is uh, it's equal to one if I is equal to J and zero otherwise. Um, and so this expression that comes up in many places, not just in numerical analysis or linear algebra either. It's just a convenience for a shorthand for this type of situation that can come up fairly often. Um, okay. Uh, another thing, the tool in proving these is a formula for matrix vector multiplication, which is, uh, if I have a, um, I'll use the matrix B because that's what I have here. Uh, if I take uh, BX and I want the ith component, um, then that component of a matrix vector product um, is this. Um, this is one of those good to know formulas that comes up in quite a few situations. Okay, so so soon I'll show you how to use these to compute the gradient of this. Um, okay, now once we have a gradient and we see where it's equal to zero, we also have to confirm that that's a critical point. Is it a minimum? Because a critical point could be a minimum or a maximum or a saddle point or or none of the three. Um, and that's where we use the Hessian. Uh, so the, the Hessian is a matrix of second partial derivatives. And because mixed second partial derivatives are always equal if, if everything is continuous. Um, and that's what we have here. Uh, what we differentiate with respect to I first or J for first. Um, as long as we have continuity, then uh, um, those are equal. Therefore, the matrix a Hessian is uh, symmetric. Okay. okay. Um, all right. So now... Um, we need the Hessian of our function 5x. Okay, so this is something I in the book as a sign as a problem, but um, I'll have to work out that problem. Thankfully, I did not already assign it. Um, so what I'm going to do first is rewrite phi. Now, dang it. Now, this is a two norm squared. Now, what's helpful here is that the two norm squared of a vector is also the dot product or inner product of a vector with itself. So I can write it this way. And then what I can do is uh, uh, basically foil it. So I would have uh, B transpose B. Um, minus AX transpose B. Minus B transpose AX. Um, 
and then plus AX transpose AX. Okay. Um, now, here I have AX, the whole thing transpose in a couple places. Um, and uh, what I need to do there, okay. What's it complaining about? Okay. Um, all right. Um, is use a property that the transpose of a product is the product of a transposes in reverse order. So if I go ahead and copy this. All right. So AX transpose, that's the same as X transpose, A transpose. Um, and then I have uh, same thing here. X transpose, A transpose, A, X. Okay. Um, also, uh, if we're assuming that um, uh, actually, I shouldn't have bothered with this. If um, we're assuming everything is real, here we have dot product of AX and B. Here we have dot product of B and AX. For real vectors, dot product is commutative. So these terms are actually uh, the same. They, they can be combined. So I'm just going to do that. Okay. Um, so now that I have this rewritten, I can go ahead and take the gradient. Now, B transpose B doesn't have X at all, so that will contribute nothing. Um, now, here I have B transpose AX. Um, so that is this similar situation. Oh, um, let's see. I'm going to write this a little differently to make the next step easier. B transpose AX using that same property about transposes. I can write it that way. Um, so B transpose A is the same as A transpose B whole thing transposed, and that's taking an inner product of X. So this right here is the same situation as this function here, where a vector C is A transpose B. Therefore, the gradient of this whole thing is this constant vector, A transpose B. So in my gradients, I'm going to have minus A transpose B. Okay. And then over here, this situation, X transpose A transpose AX, this is the same situation as this function, where B is A transpose A. So I have plus, and then I'm going to have um, one half. And then I have uh, A transpose A plus A transpose A transpose X. But A transpose A is symmetric. If I take the transpose of this, remember, transpose of product is product of transposes in reverse order. I'm going to get the same thing back. So because these are symmetric, these are actually the same. So I end up having one half two A transpose AX. So the one, uh, one half and a two will cancel, and I'm just left with A transpose A X minus A transpose B. Uh, so, so that is the gradient. 
and I want to be equal to zero. Um, all right. Um, now, the Hessian of this function would be just B plus B transpose. Um, so, from that same reasoning, Whoops. Say transpose A. Okay. Questions up to this point. All right, so we're about to have a solution to our least squares problem, at least using this approach. All right, so we reiterate A has full column rank. Um, so because A has linearly independent columns, if X is non zero, then AX is also non zero. So then this expression right here, um, which can be written as AX transpose AX. Well, that's the two norm of AX squared. Because remember, it's dot product of a vector with itself. It's always a two norm squared. Well, AX is non-zero. Therefore, this is strictly positive. So, A transpose A, which is already known to be symmetric, is positive definite. So, Falling back in our multivariable calculus, and hopefully this has been a useful refresher for that because it's probably been quite a while since you took that class. The Hessian, which is A transpose A, is positive definite. So the critical point that we have, which comes from setting a gradient equal to zero, is a minimum. So we're able to confirm that. So, to summarize what's going on here with this least squares problem, um, okay. So setting our gradient equal to zero, we get a critical point if and only if X satisfies this system of equations. And these are called the normal equations. Uh, so this is how Gauss first described a solution of a least squares problem. So that's what we do. If if uh, we have a rectangular matrix A, so AX equals B may not have a solution at all, we find X so that B minus AX, the residual, is as small as possible by solving the normal equation. So that'll give us the X that is the minimizer. Now, um, if A is M by N, A transpose A is N by N. So if we have a situation where we have many more rows and columns, maybe we only have a few columns, then this is a small system to solve. So hopefully this would be uh, pretty efficient. Um, and what we could do, A transpose A is symmetric positive definite. So we can solve this using a Cholesky factorization applied to A transpose A. Yeah. 
so um oh there goes the dog again <laughs> um so this system of equations definitely has a unique solution yeah. and, and therefore so does a full full rank least squares problem yeah. All right. um we can also look at the uh, phi of x from a point of view of a Taylor expansion. It would be a multivariable Taylor expansion. So I'll show you what that looks like. So phi of x is equal to phi of x star. So if we're taking a Taylor expansion around this uh, x star, then the multivariable Taylor expansion would be uh, so value at x star plus a gradient at x star dot product with x minus x star. So this is like the tangent line approximate or tangent plane approximation to phi and then the second derivative term is a quadratic form involving the hessian uh, so this is what a multivariable taylor expansion looks like at least up to the quadratic term uh, but the thing is if um x star is a solution of a normal equations then the gradient is zero so this term goes away uh, the Hessian is known to be A transpose A, so I fill that in here. And it's symmetric positive definite. So this term right here, if X is not equal to X star, this term is guaranteed to be positive. Therefore, phi of X is strictly greater than phi of X star. So, so what does that tell us? Um, it's not only a local minimum, it's a global minimum. Okay. So that's how we can conclude that X star is a unique solution of a full rank least squares problem. So it was one and only X that minimizes the residual vector B minus AX, at least in the, the two norm sense. Any questions at this point? All right, now one, so it sounds like, oh, we're done with the least squares problem, but there's a little more to it than that, um, that the, um, uh, the um, normal equations may not be the best way to go. But one thing I want to point out is, um, okay, uh, the first homework problem from this section that I did assign, uh, 413, um, some of you may have dealt with computing the least squares line. Like if you have a set of points in the plane, you know, X values, Y values, and you um, find the line that is closest to them in a least square sense. Like I remember doing that in a statistics class once. Um, you can derive those formulas for the slope and um, Y intercept of the least squares line by solving the normal equations of the appropriate matrix A. So uh, the first problem in the homework for this section, um, for this chapter four, um, takes you through that process. Okay, but now I have to tell you what's wrong for normal equations. Um, okay. Um, Now, when um, A is a square invertible matrix, the condition number is uh, norm of A times norm of A inverse. But what if A is M by N and M is greater than N? It's not a square matrix, then there's no um, inverse. It simply doesn't have one. Um, so what do we do in that case? Um, let's see. I have to check on which problems I assigned here. Three, four, seven, and ten. Um, oh, okay, this gets into some homework problems that I um, I have assigned, so I can't give away how how it's derived anyway. Um, but um, okay, 
Um, but I, I'll, I'll simply tell you a final result, and that's something you can deal with in the homework. Um, so the condition number of a transpose A, now this is a square matrix and it does have an inverse, so it does make sense in that case. However, um, it happens to be, again, okay, this is in a two norm sense. It's the condition number of A squared, where I need an alternative formula here. Um, I define the um, condition number of a non-square matrix A as the square root of the largest eigenvalue of A transpose A divided by the uh, smallest eigenvalue of A transpose A. So, so this is a notion of two norm condition number that works regardless of whether A is square or not, because it works with eigenvalues of the matrix A transpose A, which is square. Um, okay. So, um, Uh, so one, so one of the uh, problems in the homework is where you derive this formula that the condition number of A transpose A is a condition number of A squared. So in other words, suppose A is already ill-conditioned in this sense, then the normal equations will be that much worse condition. Um, so that's one big problem with the normal equations is they tend to be much more ill-conditioned than the original system AX equals B itself. Um, so the answer that you get by numerically solving the normal equations, like you know, in, like in MATLAB, for instance, might not be as uh, trustworthy as you would like. It might be um, excessive uh, round-off error. Okay. So that's why it's important to consider another approach. Um, Okay. Um, and that takes me to the QR factorization, something I'll be spending a lot of time on in, the up, in upcoming classes. Okay. Now, um, so we saw, uh, we're talking about pivoting um, and LU factorization. We came across an orthogonal matrix. So a square matrix is orthogonal um, if Q transpose Q is identity. Um, and what that helps us with is that um, if Q is orthogonal, then the two norm of Q times X is equal to the two norm of X. And this is what I'm saying up here. The two the vector two norm is invariant under a orthogonal transformation. So, uh, so multiplying uh, X by a, um, Orthogonal matrix does not change uh, the two norm. So, um, so we're trying to minimize the norm of residual vectors. So we can, instead of minimizing the residual vector directly, b minus ax, we can multiply that by an orthogonal matrix and try to minimize that instead, because that would give us the same uh, minimum in, in case uh, that would give us something easier to work with. So we're going to try to find orthogonal matrix Q so that we can transform a problem of minimizing this into an equivalent problem of uh, so Q transpose B minus AX. So it doesn't matter if I put Q or Q transpose. If Q is orthogonal, Q transpose is also orthogonal. 
not something that can be shown directly. So maybe if we choose the right queue, we have something easier to work with. So if I can find a factorization like this, A is equal to Q times R, where Q is orthogonal, um, and I want this matrix uh, R, which breaks down into a square matrix R1 and all zeros, I want this to be as simple as possible to work with. Um, now, uh, I've broken down Q into its columns. So Q1 is the first N columns of A, uh, sorry, of Q, and Q2 is all the remaining columns. Um, I, I don't know anything about R1 just yet, except it's squares N by N. And it's going to be non-singular just because a is not singular. Okay. So then Q transpose times A is equal to R because if I multiply both sides by Q transpose, I have Q transpose QR. But Q transpose Q is identity. So I have this relationship. So now if I go back to the problem I'm trying to solve in the first place, so I'm trying to find a uh, minimum of B minus AX. Um, okay. Sorry, I found yet another mistake in the book. Um, okay. Here I, I should, um, here I should, sorry, up here, here, I need to make clear what I'm taking a minimum over. I, I have that down here. I'm taking a minimum over all X and RN. It should say that here. Okay. Okay. So now the minimum of this two norm is the same as the minimum of this two norm because I'm multiplying by an orthogonal matrix, which preserves two norms. So then, uh, I just distribute to Q transpose, so I have Q transpose A here, but that is equal to R, which has this breakdown right here. Now, if I break down this vector, Q transpose B, this is a vector of length M. So if uh, C is the first N components and D is the rest, then I can write the whole thing this way. So Q transpose B is breaks down to components C and D. So now I can write this as the minimum of its top part, C minus R1X, two norm squared, plus the two norm of the bottom part, which is just D. So it breaks down like this. And that's just because this is a vector two norm. It's a square root of, su of sum of squares of all the components. So here are the first n components. I take a sum of squares of all those, and that's in here, plus sum of squares of all the remaining components. That goes here. Now, this second part doesn't depend on x at all. So I can focus on this one. I just want to make this as small as possible. But R1 is a square invertible matrix. I can solve this system exactly. So in other words, I can make this part zero, and then all I have left is this. Um, so to find my least square solution X, I compute this factorization, and then solve this system of equations. And then that'll give me the X that minimizes the residual, it minimizes this, and the value of the smallest two norm is two norm of D.
Now, I want the system to be easy to solve. And I can do that if I try to find R that is upper triangular. So that's the key property of R. So Q is orthogonal, R is upper triangular. Therefore, R1 is upper triangular and invertible. So I can just solve this system. This factorization that I need, A equals QR, is called the QR factorization of A. So that is the other and really preferred approach to um, um, solving a full rank least squares problem is by finding the QR factorization. Um, now, how do we do that? Well, I haven't said anything about that yet, and I don't have time today. Uh, but that's what uh, literally the next three class periods are on, devoted to three different approaches to computing the QR factorization that all have our different advantages and disadvantages. Um, so, um, so get prepared to be really sick of a QR factorization. Um, and if that isn't bad enough, when we get to chapter six, eventually on eigenvalues, the QR factorization will become very important again. So. You're probably just trying to make a QR factorization to your friend because you're not getting rid of it anytime soon. Um, okay. Um, so, um, but yeah, this is a very useful um, factorization indeed um, in several aspects of uh, numerical linear algebra. Um, and it's even going to be very useful in uh, the thesis of someone in this class. Um, okay. Um, what are we want to make? OK, um, so the thing is, since we're dealing with. Basically, we're trying to reduce. A. To upper triangular form. What way do we already have of reducing a matrix to upper triangular form? Gaussian elimination. Yeah. Um, so one might think, well, why don't we just do that if we already have that? And the reason why is if we factor A equals LU instead of QR, then basically we'd be multiplying the two norm of uh, multiplying the residual vector by L inverse. Uh, so that would be the counterpart if we were doing Gaussian elimination instead. The problem is L inverse is not an orthogonal matrix. The two norm would be changed. Um, so that would mean that yeah, we can go ahead and compute A equals LU if it was a square matrix or do something Gaussian elimination like and solve this problem. The tr trouble is the X that we find that would minimize this would not necessarily be the X that minimizes this. So we'd be solving a wrong problem. <clears throat> OK. Um, so we have some time now. Uh, I've, I've covered everything I need to do for today. Um, does anyone have any questions on this or homework? Um, what we're saying is these methods are for solving over determined systems, right? Um, yeah, it's all about solving overdetermined systems. So, like, are the numerical methods for solving underdetermined systems? Uh, I'm sorry, what? Are the numerical methods for solving underdetermined systems? Okay, uh, I'm really sorry. I'm having difficulty understanding. Like, uh, since we have overdetermined, we have underdetermined, right? Oh, 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 are you not, not asking about underdetermined? Yes. So, are the methods oh, okay. for solving underdetermined or? We just add equations. OK, um, this particular approach um, cannot be used for underdetermined systems. Now, so underdetermined systems is an example of a, um, a rank deficient least squares problem. Um, uh, so just because if M is uh, strictly less than N, um, then uh, there's there's no way you can have full column rank. Um, so there are related approaches to this one, 
that could involve either the QR factorization or the um, singular value decomposition, uh, which I actually will be talking about the singular value decomposition uh, a bit later on. And um, so, OK, when you have an underdetermined system, um, all right, so, so you can find x of so ax equals b um, in the uh, if uh, if b is in a range of ax, but regardless, it's possible to um, minimize b minus ax where x is not unique um, in the underdetermined underdeterm under case. You have infinitely many solutions, so you need some criterion to um, narrow it down to a unique solution. And uh, one uh, natural criterion is to find make X have a minimum norm. Um, so one thing I'll be showing you later is how to find the minimum norm least square solution in that underdetermined case using the uh, singular value decomposition. OK. Um, yeah, when you have um, A not being full rank, um, then, um, and you want to compute the QR factorization, you can, but because of a lack of full rank, you have to do uh, pivoting. Uh, it's somewhat similar to what's done in Gaussian elimination, but in this case, instead of interchanging rows, you are interchanging columns. So it's called QR with column pivoting. Uh, which works for the rank deficient case. So um, section 4.3, which I'm not covering in this class, is all about the rank deficient case. <clears throat> um, other questions? Any homework questions? Hmm, so the homework due on Monday, I thought for sure there would be some. <laughs> and again, it is a whole five days away. Well, I know some of you are working on it. Of course, I know some of you have also been busy with PDE homework. So. Okay. Or maybe some of you all just want to rest for PDE. <laughs> yes. On 413. Uh, we just use. Yeah, are we just using equation 4.1, right? Uh, okay, 413. Um, uh, yeah, so you're gonna um, form the normal equations and, and, and solve them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for that one, A transpose A will be two by two because A has two columns. So, um, it's helpful to use a formula for the inverse of a two by two. Okay. And I think is these formulas for the slope and y intercept of a least squares line, you, know, you can find those on the web very easily. So you can use that to uh, check your result. But of course, I will be looking at your work <laughs> uh, to get there. <clears throat> And yes, I actually did once that I can recall in particular have a situation where I gave a problem. I think it was like verifying a trig identity. And uh, so someone has a certain expression of inner transforming it into another one using trig identities. And uh, someone really tried to sneak it by me that they just wrote some steps that weren't going anywhere and then just dumped straight to the answer. Um, and thought I, because they wrote a lot of steps that I wouldn't notice. It's like, uh -huh, yeah, right. So, <clears throat> okay.
Going once. Going twice. Okay, well, that means it's more time to rest up for PDE. So, <laughs> so I'll, I'll see some of you there. <laughs> Stop the recording now.